Should Christians pray for world peace this year when Christ predicted increasing warfare? Let's pray. Thank you for the reminder of that last song. All of my days are held in your hand. All of our days, all that we're going to get, are, are held in your hand. There's only so many of them. Church, look at me just for a sec. It's like, take your hands like that, and if I were to fill them up, say, with M&Ms, okay? And those are your days. There's a fixed number. And then every day I come, there you are, and I take one of them out. And the next day I come and I take another one of them out. It's a pretty humbling thing, isn't it? There's your life. And they're there in God's hands. No wonder, no wonder. Teach me, O oh Lord, to live all of my life through your eyes, because I don't always see things like that. And if you don't teach me, I'll live life like it doesn't matter that every day one of those M&Ms disappears. And help me not to waste one of them. Uh, the truth is, we pray for different needs. The truth is, the person on your left, the person on your right, they are all terminal. And so, Lord, do teach us the value of your word, the importance of eternity, the preciousness of redeeming grace, the beauty of the blessed hope, the resurrection of the body, the second coming of Jesus, an inheritance that is kept for us, Peter says, unfading. We have life's greatest treasure in Jesus Christ. We are grateful. More grateful than we can express. But thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who lives in our lives. And help us now as we look into your word on this difficult topic, but an important one. Come among us in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 13, 7, Jesus is speaking. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars... Do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Those things, that's the wars, they must take place. And what interests me is that one little word, must take place. I don't suppose there are many subjects that can sort of uh, arouse more angst on both sides of the issue than the topic of war, the Christian response to war. Probably you've thought of the arguments on both sides. There are devoted Christians who feel compelled to carry signs in peace marches and they protest violence. In the Middle East, in Syria, North Korea, wherever. Conservatives, liberals, Republicans, Democrats, everyone claims the moral high ground. And there are equally devout Christians who feel it would be immoral for those who have the power and the ability to intervene against violence and uh, ethnic cleansing. There are Christians who feel like if there's someone that has the military might to stop that and they don't, that that's an immoral act not to do so. And I know, I don't suppose the church will ever be fully and finally united on some of these controversial issues. That's not really my purpose here. I do feel Christians on both sides of the issue would say they're passionately in the pursuit of peace, even though maybe differing on how that goal should be reached. I think all of us would be united in praying, Lord... Bring peace to this corrupt, violent, war, 
torn world, in Jesus' name, bring peace. It's that prayer that I want to talk about. It's that prayer that raises an interesting problem. In what sense should Christians pray for peace when Jesus, in our text, clearly says, referring to the increase of warfare in the earth, that these things must take place? What does that mean, must take place? And if wars must take place, then, then am I going against God when I pray for peace? You see what I'm saying? Goodness knows it's hard enough to believe God when praying for anything as big as global peace, but now do I actually have to face the possibility that uh, even God doesn't want such peace to exist? How am I supposed to pray in faith with that possibility lurking in the back of my mind? I don't even pretend to have the ability to answer all of those questions. I mean, I have my political views. I work pretty hard. Uh, I have a lot of people that come up and they'll ask me, so how do you vote, Pastor Don? And I used to say something like, I don't really think you're supposed to ask me that. <clears throat> I try pretty hard to keep my political views out of the pulpit ministry of our church. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not the political property of any party, right or left. Yet we need to have some understanding about this. How Christians can pray for peace when Jesus said these things must take place. Point number one. Christians should pray for peace while understanding there are times when God uses moral evils in this world to accomplish his divine purpose. I find Paul's words interesting. Paul commands us to pray for peace in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. First of all, then, urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. He says, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceable and peaceable and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. It is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Okay, how does that work, Pastor Don? How can I give honor to the words of Jesus, these things must take place, and still obey this injunction from the Apostle Paul at the same time, praying for peace? Here's what I know. I do know that it's right to pray for peace. Here's an example that I think of a lot. Jesus does the very same thing. When you think about his death and the circumstances surrounding his death and the explanation for his death in the scriptures, I think you have two there. Acts 2.23, Peter explains the cross of Jesus, and he says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This Jesus delivered up, that's on the cross, crucified, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So, was it God's will that Jesus die on the cross? You can answer me. Yes, it was. Absolutely it was. This is certain how the early church understood it. The other reference is Acts 4, 27, 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, Listen, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So, here's what we know for sure. We know for sure 
that it was God's will that Jesus be nailed to that cross. In the old King James, it's so striking in Isaiah 53. I've preached on it before. For, for the Father was pleased to crush him. I wouldn't have written that. So it's God's will. And then we see Jesus, who clearly, read the New Testament, Jesus had a clear understanding. He came to give his life a ransom for many, right? Jesus knew why he came. He knew he was going to die for the sins of the world. He knows that that's the Father's will, that that's the Father's plan. And then you see Jesus in the garden, Matthew 26, 39. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So, here's what I conclude from that. I take that to mean, if we're following Christ's example, that we are entitled and even encouraged to pray against things that are unjust and immoral in this world, even though God may be using those things to accomplish his greater good. The fact that there are some things that simply must take place doesn't mean we can't pray for those events to pass from us. And I get that example from Jesus. Everybody follow me that far? All right. That's just the first step. So we know that it's not improper to pray for peace, even though Jesus says these things must take place. And we get that from the example of Jesus himself. Two, our prayers should be guided by what we know from our perspective to be righteous and just for mankind here on earth. Matthew 6.10, you know the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's, there's the request, as well as we know, for God's will to unfold on this earth, and that there's submission still. Let it be done here just like it is in heaven. And I don't know how God's will unfolds in heaven. I'm not there. I don't know how all the angels do his bidding. So it ties in with our last point. We pray from our view of things. We simply don't know very much about the will of God in heaven, the way angelic beings perform it, or the hidden thoughts in the mind of God. We don't know those things because we live here on earth. We're finite. He's infinite. So we have to be guided in our prayers as best we can from the information in the scriptures, from the commandments of God. It's the only information we have. We simply don't know all of God's will on any specific point. Are we prepared to admit that? We simply don't know all of God's will on any specific point. And so what we do is, we pray from our perspective, humbly, submissively, with our understanding, where we're commanded to pray about things in the Scripture. What I'm saying is, all things being equal, we're to pray for our world in ways that are in keeping with the way God has commanded us. Not trying to guess how his will may unfold in his sovereign decrees for nations and this planet. We do know God's commanded us to keep from dishonesty, sexual immorality, hatred, bitterness, Violence, bloodshed in our own lives, vengeance. And so, all things being equal, this is the way we should pray. Three. And now it gets a little complicated. We should always pray for peace humbly, knowing that a sovereign God may leave open the possibility of a just war. Look at Romans 13, 1 to 6. 
Paul writes, and he says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good. You will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not, this is interesting, he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Now, It's important not to confuse two things in the Scripture. There is what we would call the, uh, this isn't in your notes, the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount for, for his disciples and how they conduct themselves in personal relationships. And it's very easy to take that, rip it out of context, and apply it where it doesn't apply. So you wrong me. You come up and you strike me on the cheek. It's just a, an example. What am I supposed to do in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, I turn the other cheek. The, the point is, you don't return treatment in kind. You don't stick up for your rights personally. You don't take personal vengeance. You don't strike back when someone strikes you. That's not how disciples of Jesus act. Well, is there no place for vengeance on wrongdoers? Yes, there is, but it's not yours personally. Then you flip over to Romans 13. God has put authorities on earth, and what you can't do personally, they can do under his authority. They act as his representatives. There's vengeance for wrongdoers. When you and I are commanded not to take personal vengeance in our own hands, it's with the recognition that God has given governing authorities the right and obligation not only to make requests and negotiate deals, but it says to bear the sword. There are times when governing bodies and authorities are called to turn back injustice and oppression with appropriate violence. That's what a sword is, correct? It's not a paperweight, not in Paul's day. It's not something you hung up above your fireplace. He's talking about armament. That's what he's talking about. I know those are complex issues. If I, if I see an old lady across the street. Let's say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm walking along Main Street, Newmarket. It's late, and I see an old lady, and she's over here, and two young thugs come out of an alley, and they grab her, and they throw her up against the wall. She's in a walker, and they kick the walker, and they throw her up against the wall, and they start going through her purse, and they start slapping her. I'm across the street. Do I have a moral obligation to help her? How many say yes? How many say no? Okay, so we're pretty much united on yes. There are times if you see injustice in some way, to do nothing is morally wrong. If I just turn my head and walk away, I'm not... I'm not on the same level as those two thugs, but I'm not much better. 
than those two thugs. But it's not that simple. It's easy to make the decision and say, well, yeah, you should run over there, Pastor Don, do your best, and, and help that woman. Maybe you'll take your cell phone, call the police, but you can't just stand there and watch them beat her to death. But I don't know how it's going to turn out. If I run across the street, I don't know with certainty, are there, are there others in the alley? I can't see them yet. In other words, will my getting involved escalate the violence? It might, right? Right? You, you simply, when you choose to get involved in a situation like that, you simply don't have absolute knowledge of whether you're going to be successful. Correct? Is that an excuse for not doing anything? Probably not. But you can see now, if you push out the walls and you start to think on a global scale, I'm not arguing for one side or the other. I'm simply saying you can see why it's a complicated issue. Where people may get involved in a situation that they think is unjust or immoral, and you get involved, but you don't know when you get involved. And now we're not talking about a man running across the street. Now we might be talking about soldiers. We might be talking about planes. We might be talking about whatever. But you don't know when you get involved how it's going to turn out. Is it going to be successful? Is it not going to be successful? And so there's, there's this issue. There's this dilemma. Those aren't easy questions. But in such cases, our prayers should be for divine wisdom, for peace, for relief from undue misery, an expeditious return of merciful, just conditions. So wherever you are on the political spectrum and whatever your view of just or unjust war or whether you're a pacifist, I'm not... I'm not going there. What I am saying is, how do Christians pay, pray for peace? And it needs to be done, it needs to be done with humility. And it needs to be done with understanding. And it can't just be the kind of peace that says, fooey on anybody else, as long as I'm relatively peaceful and prosperous. It can't be that. Point number four. Christians should pray for peace knowing that peace itself is not the ultimate goal of Almighty God, but serves, that is peace, serves as the most effective means to what is most important to God, the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. I get that from Paul's words that I read earlier in 1 Timothy 2, 1-4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all those in high places, that we may lead a peaceful and a quiet life, godly, dignified in every way. And you think it would stop there. That's a good prayer request. But it doesn't. This is good, this praying for peace and the results of that prayer. This is good. It's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Why? Who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For Christians to pray for peace and not commit their lives and resources to the missionary task at hand is hypocritical and uninformed. This sentence might surprise you. The only reason the scriptures give to pray for peace is the conversion of the lost to Jesus Christ, God the Son. What I'm saying is, that is the only stated reason. I'm not saying there aren't other benefits. I'm simply saying that is the only reason stated. Paul makes an unmistakable link between three things in that important text. Praying for national and international leaders, that would be kings in Paul's days, rulers. Praying for national and international leaders, 
The second thing he talks about, making our desire known to God for peaceful living conditions among peoples and nations. That's the second thing. And the third thing is recognizing that God's ultimate desire that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Paul links those three things together. That's the thinking behind praying for world peace. It won't be hazardous in that kind of a world for people to point men and women to Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says, there's your primary reason. There's the motive. It's not merely humanitarianism. It's evangelism. It's evangelism. We need to be thoughtful about this. It's dreadfully easy to a church adopt right actions for inadequate reasons. There are vast segments of the church today who are frantic in their scramble to promote peace, but who do so for purely humanitarian reasons. And there's nothing wrong with expressing humanitarian concerns. We should care about those kinds of issues. But, and this is the important point, we should also know why we, as Christians, express those concerns. Why are we to care about the poor, the dying, the battered, the persecuted, the oppressed? I think the church, in the scriptures, the church has a unique contribution to make at that point. It's different from that of the United Way or the Red Cross. We alone have the ultimate reason to pray for peace. And the reason isn't just the absence of war. The reason is the reaching of the lost. So here are the four principles. Pray for peace, knowing that God can and does use moral evil, like war, to accomplish his purpose in this fallen world at times. B, pray for peace using God's commands for how Christians should live as a guide. In other words, order your prayers around the commands God has given us rather than trying to figure out what he has chosen to keep to himself in his sovereign providence over this world. Three, pray for peace recognizing fully that there are appropriate times for just war and the use of the sword, whether we like it or understand it or not, I will rarely be able to discern those times perfectly because they rarely unfold tidily and neatly in this fallen world. And four, pray for peace knowing that God's ultimate goal is never merely the absence of war, but the spreading of the gospel. We probably don't pray enough. I'm done with the notes. You can put them away. We probably don't pray as much as we should for people who lead in the affairs of nations all over this world. Because I'll tell you something about leading anything. Uh, leading sucks in today's world, leading almost anything, but especially in, in political affairs, who, who, who would ever go into that thinking he or she has the adequate wisdom to make the kind of decisions that have to be made? I can't imagine those kinds of decisions, and the church needs to be at prayer probably a little less critical and probably a little more prayerful. But praying always with an eye to the heart of Father God for conditions to be such in this world where the gospel of Jesus Christ can run successfully. I hope this year maybe you'll set aside sometime every day or at least every week you know, when you're watching the news, just, just take out a little... Well, I guess you don't do pad and pencil anymore, but take your iPad or whatever. I still use a pen and paper sometimes. I try to make notes about 
world leaders that I didn't know. All sorts of world leaders. I don't even know their names. And I have this feeling that I'm supposed to be praying for them. I'm praying that God will give them wisdom. I'm praying that God will give them patience. And I'm praying that God will open their eyes to the gospel. So make a mental note of that. Let's be doing it regularly as a church, okay? Let's be doing that.